So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this interesting meeting and uh, to allow me to give a, a view from Switzerland, which is also part of Europe, at least geographically. <laughs> And my talk will focus on uh, life science and I would like to tell you about a few data management and publication tools that we have developed for this uh, specific applications at the ETH. But before I start, I would like to take a little step back and just mention again this, uh, this word reproducibility, which has been uh, already mentioned a few times. And I would like to uh, suggest that in the life sciences we really have a big problem with uh, reproducibility. And this has come to the attention in recent years by a couple of papers that came out from mainly the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, what people did there is they tried to reproduce uh, published data uh, in order to uh, validate uh, drug targets. And the astonishing thing they found was that actually most of the uh, published studies could not be reproduced. So in this paper, for example, it was reported that uh, investigation of 67 uh, projects, only about 20% of them, uh, the uh, literature data were in line with, with, with what was found in the in-house investigation. This is not the only example. There's uh, another example where uh, 53 landmark papers, so really from uh, big journals, were investigated. And uh, it's actually amazing that in only 6% of the cases, so 11%, uh, in six cases, so 11%, the uh, findings could be reproduced. So that should be a, a wake up call. And uh, this bad because it's uh, leading to a loss of credibility of science in the, in, in the public sphere, but it's also bad because the, the pharma industry, which is a big uh, sponsor of life science research, is uh, questioning whether this is, the money is actually well spent. So what uh, could be the reason for this low uh, reproducibility? And I would like to suggest that at least some of the uh, factors underlying the low reproducibility have to do with uh, uh, yeah, data management problems. In many uh, cases uh, in life sciences, we still uh, see very simple data management approaches in the, uh, in the labs. So people have their lab books. In the best case, they have only one, but usually they have actually several lab books and uh, they keep data locally stored on their uh, desktop computers. And this, of course, has been working well for, uh, for quite some time. But uh, in recent years, we have seen an explosion of uh, data coming into the field. There's new measurement devices. Uh, most people are familiar with sequencing. But there's also uh, quantitative imaging and proteomics, which create uh, on the order of terabytes per, per day. And uh, this kind of data is just not uh, suitable anymore for the uh, classical data management. We also have a trend to larger consortia in uh, life sciences where uh, biologists, for example, collaborate with people with different expertises like modelers in order to exchange the data. And it's not possible just to send uh, any more of these kind of uh, high throughput data with, uh, with an Excel sheet by, by email or uh, on a, even on a floppy disk and uh, on a USB stick in most cases, as we, as we have seen before. So this uh, problem uh, became apparent in a, in a consortium that was launched in Switzerland in 2008. It's a systems biology consortium where people from different universities collaborate on, on these kind of data. And uh, for example, modelers from the University of Zurich would collaborate with experimenters from the University of Basel also. And they somehow had to exchange and uh, deal with, uh, with the large amounts of data. And uh, our group, uh, basically the scientific IT services, were tasked with uh, solving this uh, problem. And what we did is we developed a data management uh, system which is, uh, which is geared uh, towards this, uh, these problems. And so this is uh, OpenBIS, which is, stands for Open Biological Information System. And OpenBIS is a data management system that allows biologists and bioinformaticians to structure their data in a very organized way. And uh, we are supporting these kind of high throughput 
uh, techniques and we are directly getting the data into the system from these techniques. So in the, uh, in the spirit of what was uh, talked before, we really capture the data at the source and we capture everything and put it into this uh, kind of uh, web-based uh, system. On the other hand, then we have the, the scientists who do not, uh, so uh, they, the scientists has to have a learning experience in a way. They are not uh, uh, allowed to uh, take the data home with them anymore, but rather they log on to a web browser, which is now getting, of course, more and more familiar. And they uh, there deal uh, with the analysis of the data, they annotate data, they search data, and so on. We also connect the data to uh, data processing pipelines, which we develop, for example, on our cluster-based architecture, because the processing of these data is also something which is rather uh, time-consuming. And there's also tools for visualization of uh, results. And finally, the reason why I'm also telling you all this is uh, clearly we have now started to develop uh, also tools for publishing this uh, data. But as we heard also previously, the data is actually not enough just to, uh, just to store the data and to publish the data. We also need to look at the methods and the uh, materials and the uh, samples that are being used by the scientists. So to be able to do this, we have extended our, uh, uh, our, our management system by uh, ELN. So ELN stands for Electronic Lab Notebook. Uh, LIMP system, Laboratory uh, Integrated Management System, and uh, this allows us really to track all these kinds of information. So we have uh, tools for tracking like the protocols, the, uh, the chemicals in the lab, or the samples are being used. So uh, this is an example of a list of uh, chemicals that is, for example, used in one of the labs, and you can uh, keep track of the the, the names, the, where the samples are stored, and so on and so on. So we have all this uh, data now in a, in a centralized uh, format, and uh, next what we want to do is really also make this data publicly available. And uh, we first thought about what are the requirements for making the data publicly available. Well, one of the uh, most important ones is uh, to have a friend, user-friendly interface which causes as little possible additional work for the scientists because the, uh, in our experience uh, most of the scientists they are not really so keen on publishing the data they are publishing more more focusing on publishing the papers important for us is also not to duplicate data because as i told you we are dealing with labs which create uh, terabytes of data in the order of days or weeks and uh, this storage is expensive, so we have no option to uh, put the data, for example, just a copy of somewhere else. And we wanted to have different uh, levels of access in order to uh, make the data available to different kinds of people during the research process. So maybe in the beginning, scientists only want to have uh, collaborators uh, get access, and then later during the reviewing phase, the reviewer, and then finally, hopefully, after the paper is published, access to the uh, whole world. So this is a view of our uh, publication interface. It's actually uh, very simple, so it's embedded in the, uh, the web interface. Do I have a point? Oh, yeah. It's embedded in the uh, web interface of OpenBIS, which is uh, it's kind of hard to see here. But uh, we, uh, we put in manually uh, some kind of uh, metadata in order to in allow the classification of the data, we have decided also to add uh, so-called MESH terms. So MESH terms are medical subject headings from the National Library of Medicine. They're well known via uh, PubMed. So the scientists, or in our most cases, it's actually we who do the publication of the data. They can select them, these kind of uh, MESH terms which describe their, uh, their research. And uh, there's then in the end just a simple publish button which we are kind of then uh, which you press and then the data becomes publicly available. What does it mean uh, the data is uh, publicly available? We will have the raw and the metadata uh, available in OpenBIS directly and we think this is more useful for the peers of the scientists who might actually also use this uh, system and not so much for the, uh, for the general public because it's a kind of com complicated, uh, complicated system that you have to get to know. Uh, but we also expose the metadata 
via OEI PMH uh, data source. So as has been uh, already mentioned in the previous talk. This allows us to include uh, the metadata in, in metadata repositories. And recently, we have uh, been part of setting up also a very similar uh, repository as has been discussed in the previous talk uh, in uh, Switzerland. So it's actually also called Open Research Data Switzerland, ORD at CH. And here we have included our basically open biz publication pipeline via this OAI PMH harvesting in this uh, in, in this metadata repository. And uh, this is just a quick view, that's how it uh, looks. This is one uh, data set in the, uh, in the repository. We are also using CCAN, which has the advantage that it's very easy to, uh, to browse. It's a very powerful search. So that is something that most people will be able to understand. So we are uh, using this as a complementary publication interface for, uh, for OpenBIS. So with this, I would like to come to the end and uh, summarize. I presented you uh, our uh, OpenBIS, a biological information management system. It's a robust tool for data management and provenance tracking in life science labs. And it's really geared towards these large uh, data sets. So we have cu customers, uh, scientists, who are working with hundreds of terabytes. And uh, OpenBIS is actually quite capable of managing this. Um, coming back to the beginning, I would suggest that the systematic data management uh, should hopefully reduce error proneness in research and increase reproducibility. Uh, we have implemented a user-friendly publication module and an embedded this in a national metadata repository. And uh, finally, I would uh, like to say from our experience, the technical challenges of doing this uh, publication of the data are not so uh, not so big, right? Once you have the data managed in a in a nice way in a server-based infrastructure, publishing it has been uh, not a big challenge. But rather, we find that actually acceptance in uh, in the life science community uh, to get the data available. This is actually a large part of my work. So we try to lobby scientists to make data available and uh, try to convince them of all the with all the arguments that have been given in the previous talks. So with this, I would like to thank for your attention. I'm uh, painfully aware that I'm the last speaker after a long day, but I'm very happy to still see so many of you here, and uh, I'm also happy to take questions, should there be any. Thanks. Thank you, So do we have questions for Harry? I want to just about the electronic lab notebooks. Do I understand correctly that these several groups that you work with, the yeah. group members really use them instead of paper lab books? Exactly, yeah. And they, so in the beginning, we. And it is already publicly available? The, so we are currently in the process of uh, publishing the lab <laughs> notebook, but uh, all our software is available as open source. So please get in touch, and uh, you can uh, you can try it out. Yeah. Um, I was curious about how successful are you being in capturing uh, a community of scientists uh, using your system? How do you mean how? Uh, I mean, uh, are you having success capturing people to to use this system? So the, the OpenBIS is used by actually quite a few labs, so not only in Switzerland, but also in Europe and the US. So, uh, so we find, uh, normally we find two types of scientists, and this is uh, mainly also uh, divided by age. And uh, the kind of the younger people who are a little bit more internet savvy, and so they are actually uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, positive about it and adopting it in the lab. Uh, a lot of times, uh, not only, but uh, older scientists, uh, they are still a little bit resistant, right? So they are wondering, why should I, uh, why does my system from, from like the last 20 years not work anymore? But uh, there are also certainly exceptions. And usually uh, people realize once they get very large amounts of data that the traditional ways of managing this data does not uh, scale anymore. So, this one question, probably complementary to what Marta was asking. Is, uh, 
So the, the fact you are uh, working with electronic notebook makes a big difference in terms of repeatability, I think, right? So it's not just a matter of data, but also scientific matter. So you're basically sharing not only the result of mm -hmm. your uh, study, but also the method together. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the electronic notebook is, in fact, the representation of the experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a thinking. Yes. So uh, what's your experience in terms of reuse of the content of the electronic notebook as the content of data sets? So, between the two or? Yeah. so for the ELN we don't have so much experience yet because we have developed this together with two, two, three labs and uh, they, they are very, very happy using it but uh, we have not the adoption that we have with a, uh, with a data management system so that time will have to tell. But a big advantage actually of the ELN approach is that the, the PI, so the professor, can actually enforce a way of documentation on their people. So some of these labs, they have like 20, 30 people, and uh, traditionally everyone will have their own style of taking notes, right? Some people write something as a notepad on a computer, another one has uh, like a handwritten notes, and uh, after the PhD student or postdoc leaves, it's a big mess for the PI. So uh, the ELN is there very attractive, and that's what they also realize a lot of times.